Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doug Rieger Johnson, and I am a consultant of gastroenterology and medical genetics at Mayo Clinic Florida in Jacksonville. And I have the pleasure of moderating today's discussion on the Diagnostic Odyssey. Uh, we will start today with a, a talk by Dr. Costas Lazaridis um, on developing a clinic for Diagnostic Odyssey patients. Dr. Lazaridis, I have known, or I've had the pleasure of knowing for many years, is a consultant here at Hepatology, Mayo Clinic of Rochester, and has had many um, successful projects. And I want to be one of the first, hopefully one of the first, to congratulate him on renewal of his R01 grant for the study of the genetics of primary biliary cirrhosis and primary sclerosing cholangitis. Casas? Thank you, Doug. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's great to be here today on behalf of the Center for Individualized Medicine. And it's my privilege to showcase uh, an enterprise-wide effort about uh, how uh, we can establish, or how we have established an, an individualized medicine clinic uh, to better understand uh, diagnostic uh, odyssey cases. Here are our learning objectives. Uh, we like to describe to you the challenges and opportunities of establishing of such a clinic, which are from now on I'm going to refer to as IM clinic, and then explain that this effort takes a multidisciplinary uh, integrated approach uh, where we have to bring different people from different departments, divisions to make this happen, to be able to understand better those entities. And I would like now to uh, invite you to join me into a visual exercise about new perspective, about being able to see differently. Uh, I would like to show you the creative work of two designers of the previous century, Charles and Ray Ames, who they teach us that if we apply a stronger lens, we can get a different perspective about reality. This is an abbreviated version of their documentary called The Powers of Ten. DNA is the basis of genomic medicine, and they have just showed us that when we apply stronger lens, we can gain a new perspective about reality. And in genomic medicine, what we try to do, we try to use DNA uh, sequencing uh, in a way that is the stronger lens to give us a better or a new uh, perspective about how to understand the disease of, of our patients and how to treat them. Now, from the genetic uh, perspective, I would like to say that Diseases, for the most part, are classified in three different types that fluctuate over time. As you can see here, we have chromosomal uh, diseases, we have Mendelian diseases, and then complex. And for the Mendelian, those are the ones a uh, few of us uh, see in practice. There are not many, uh, and they don't represent a significant portion of the practice uh, for healthcare providers. But most of those, they uh, present early in life, and I have some paradigms here, compared to the complex, that they present later in life, and they probably present the vast majority of the entities we encounter in practice. Now, at the same time, we have to realize that from the conceptual standpoint, Mendelian and complex diseases, they are different. And so for the Mendelian disease, we have a direct correspondence between a gene and a disease, and the environmental exposure is minimal compared to the complex disease where we have multiple genes interacting with each other and with the environment to produce the uh, phenotype of interest. But at the same time, this is how we classify things. And in the reality, it may be a spectrum of processes where we have Mendelian on the left, and the very left, the more, very uh, prominent, uh, well penetrant Mendelian diseases, to then the more, uh, to less penetrant, to the ones that they interact or interfere with the complex phenotype presentation, and then to the complex diseases where the environmental exposure is probably contributing more than the Mendelian one. And, they would like, and I would like to make the case that the point where those two entities probably interact, that's a point that it may be, may be very fruitful for us now to start thinking about diagnostic odysseys and gene uh, contributing to this pathogenesis because that's a starting point in addition to the Mendelian diseases that can help us out, and well, that's what SIM envisions, to move this bar to the left, to the, to, the, to the left as far as I can see, but to the right as you can see it, in a way that we can now better understand not only the Mendelian but complex diseases. And this is a significant task, but just conceptually, this is where 
we think we, we, we would like to, uh, to be. And I'm now going to share with you a case that I, that I have um, uh, performed exome sequencing within my research and then move it to the clinic. This is a family that presented to us a few years ago. And on the bottom of the screen, I saw the different uh, phenotypic expressions for this family. The daughter of this, uh, of this family presented at a young age, probably was 15 or 16, with gallstone disease. Uh, gallstones were removed with the cholestectomy, and then developed an entity called small duct primary sclerosis and cholangitis. This is a very uh, rare uh, uh, disease of the liver that affects the bile ducts, and it's chronic to the point that develop liver failure over time. We found uh, then from the history that the mother presented with gallstone disease uh, when she was in her 40s. And in fact, the mother was diagnosed back then with small duct PSC2. That was uh, probably in the late 80s. Uh, to the point that the disease progressed and underwent a transplant. And then the other sister of, uh, of the proband developed large duct uh, primary sclerosis and cholangitis a year or two later once the diagnosis for the, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, older sister uh, was made. And so the question was, is this uh, um, uh, an interesting family? Can we apply exome sequencing? What is the cause of, of, of disease uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this nuclear family? And of course, the, um, uh, the, 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 the younger daughter presented with progressive disease to the point that needed a transplant, and she was transplanted a few years later. When we went back to the extended family, we found that many members of this family did suffer from gallstones. Even uh, this member at the very right uh, of the slide, uh, who was 13 at the time, diagnosed with gallstones, ended up to have a uh, cholecystectomy. And we did pursue exome, fam uh, exome um, uh, sequencing on the four uh, nuclear members of this family uh, on, the on the left. And we found uh, among um, a lot of uh, bioinformatics work that the main gene was, that was affected in a manner that can explain the phenotypic expression in that particular family was a new mutation uh, on this gene called ABCB4. And as you can see, uh, there are many variants within this gene. Uh, most of those were known SNPs, but there is one variant that is shared between the mother and the two daughters and is absent from the father who is not affected. And so what ABCB4 does, it's one of these transporters that transports phosphatidylcholine into the bile duct from the hepatocytes. And then when this happens, uh, it uh, creates micelles with bile acids that are present in the bile to protect the, bile, the biliary epithelia from damaging effects of the bile acids. And so if you don't transport this, uh, this, uh, this uh, substance, the phosphatidylcholine, then you have an irritation of the bile ducts over time, and then you create stones as time goes by. The good thing is that we have a treatment that uh, by changing uh, the milieu of the bile acids and make the population or the pool of bile acids to a more hydrophilic, th hydrophilic than lipophilic, then this irritation uh, can be uh, ameliorated to some extent or can prevent uh, damage over time. And going back then to this family, the question is, do they, what do they have? Do they have a Mendelian disease that is MDR3 and they have PSC on top? Or there is any other modifier gene that acts upon the existing MDR3 uh, damage, or the ABCB4, as otherwise known, to cause the phenotype. And this is, a, as we said, is an area that, for us, it's uh, important to learn uh, what, uh, what is behind the pathogenesis. But yet, knowing the Mendelian defect, if we have a therapy like orcetoxicolic acid, if we knew this 20 years ago for this family, particularly for the mother and daughters, we would be very effective. Now, to close the story and to make it also challenging from the legal standpoint or the ethical standpoint is that the daughter who was transplanted uh, received a living donor transplant from one of the sisters of them from the mother's side, and we don't know the status of this individual as far as uh, the phenotype or the genetic background, whether she carries this uh, mutation. Now, having said all those things from research, uh, I'm going to move to my clinical aspect of my presentation. And so we have research versus clinical practice. Well, you can introduce and do research in IM clinic, and what you need is basically an approved IRB protocol. To do clinical practice, you need something more than that, and that's a challenge. And so the rest of my talk will be how we are able to set up this clinic, uh, what is our experiences, what are the lessons learned, and where we go next. Our main goal here is to be able, with this new exciting technology, to create a new perspective, 
to be able to close the gap between phenotype and genotype, to be able to better understand what these phenotypes mean and how we can interfere knowing the genetic material of these individuals. With the help of bioinformatics, with bioethics, microbiome, and epigenomics, we hope that the IM clinic will be at the pivotal point to make this transport, to, me, to make this transformation, I would say, from being able now to address those variants, to address these phenotypes in the context of the variants, to have clinical applicability. And why we offer this uh, clinic? We offer because the time is right. Uh, we, uh, with the completion of the Human Genome Project, we know now that the cost of sequencing goes down, the experience and the quality of this methodology goes up. With a stronger lens of sequencing, uh, we now have a better tool to be able to impact patient care. And the Center for Individual Medicine, it brings again this mission to translate these opportunities into practice. And we think Mayo has tremendous expertise about phenotypic assessment, but we need to make the link. We need to make the approach that we can close this gap. And what are the initial offerings uh, for this uh, IM clinic of ours? Um, this was an effort that started about two years ago uh, when uh, a group of us uh, through um, the center met to uh, develop initially a, work up, a workshop, uh, work group uh, to discuss those, those, these issues. And after a lot of discussions and preparations for about 10 months, we end up of, uh, launching uh, two separate service lines uh, end of September of 2012, a year ago. And the first uh, service line was about diagnostic odyssey. Those were the di undiagnosed cases with hereditary uh, uh, elements. And then, of course, uh, the other service line was about advanced cancer, uh, where patients with solid tumor had no other uh, option uh, following uh, standard uh, uh, therapy, uh, whether chemotherapy or radiation therapy. And so then you may ask me which patients uh, fit uh, this criteria. Uh, so we say that for diagnostic odyssey, as, uh, as we know, those are people who have undiagnosed disease with, an, with a suspected genetic component. We focus on trios, uh, the proband, and two affected or un and two unaffected um, uh, relatives uh, to perform holoxome sequencing. And then this approach provides comfort, resolve, and closure. In some other cases, it may, may be made very informative from familiar planning, or in, in some cases also can lead to uh, possible therapy. And sometimes therapy may not be a new medication, but something that is now more proper for the particular case. What is the ideal case for diagnostic odyssey? Uh, as we try to understand this better and make it happen, uh, we think that multiple affected individuals with the same phenotype uh, is important uh, to have in the same family. Uh, the phenotype has to be well uh, defined, uh, whether this can be clinically or can be based on laboratory uh, parameters. And then we should have DNA available from those individuals to make, uh, make it happen so we can have exome sequencing or genome sequencing probably down the road. And what is the approach of accessing this clinic? Uh, uh, each patient is referred to the clinic and is triaged by a genetic counselor uh, of the center where the counselor uh, develops the pedigree of this particular uh, individual and, the, uh, and then is assigned to a consultant of the, uh, of the clinic. And the referrals come from either uh, the uh, internal referrals from Mayo uh, consultants, and that's how we started. And then it was expanded to external refer, uh, uh, referrals, which can be uh, other physicians uh, or patients who interacted with our website and they were uh, posing the question whether they can be uh, a case uh, for this clinic or not. In the near future, what holds for us is to create an affiliated uh, practice uh, approach throughout the network that Mayo has to provide these uh, services to those affiliated practice across, across the U.S. That's the, the, the basic flow uh, for Diagnostic Odyssey. Once we have a, a consult, uh, we may or may not see uh, uh, the patient physically. Uh, but then the counselor of SIM uh, as interacts um, uh, with, the, uh, with the patient and the family. Uh, we collect blood and then uh, samples are sequenced. Uh, we get back the report and then we have developed this uh, genomic uh, uh, odyssey board, as we call it, uh, where a number of us, and, and I will show you more details in the next few slides, uh, meet weekly to discuss the findings and provide recommendations to the referring physician and to the patient. What are the components of this clinic? Uh, there are four components. Uh, we have the IM consultants. Those are selected individuals from different divisions and departments with an interest 
uh, in individualized medicine. Uh, and those individuals uh, see those patients uh, in a virtual clinic, uh, the IM clinic. And then we have a critical component with this, which is the genomic counseling. Uh, those are certified genetic counselors who educate patients about whole exome sequ uh, sequencing, ethical issues, and also personal choices that they have for these uh, methodologies. What SIM brings to the table as a component of this clinic is uh, participation and help with the sample acquisition, navigation of samples, insurance authorizations, and appeals. And also, we have uh, the board, um, which we call it the Genomic Odyssey Board, which this is a multidisciplinary, a multi-site uh, team uh, between the three practices, Rochester, Arizona, and Florida, where we evaluate the cases, analyze the results, and provide the final recommendations to the referring physician and the, and the patient. And the Odyssey Board uh, has both standing members and ad hoc members. The standing members is the consultant in the case, along with the counselor, uh, medical geneticists from uh, all three sides of Mayo Clinic, laboratory directors, bioinformatics and analytical team representatives, biomedical ethics representatives, and then the ad hoc individuals per case are the disease experts and the referring physician. The standard order at this moment is whole exome sequencing in a clear partner lab. And uh, as you probably know, uh, this is, um, uh, has a turnaround time of about three months or so, um, uh, with a, at a cost of about $7,000. And at the same time, we took the opportunity of developing an IRB protocol where we do um, uh, analysis of the same specimens locally uh, for research purposes to be able to better understand and more extensive, extensively analyze the specimens. And in this case, uh, for those participants, after consenting, we do exome sequencing of the proband and the other uh, two uh, members of the families. Uh, involved uh, uh, in the protocol. We think the value, it's, uh, uh, it has two elements. Uh, one is about leveraging the SIM infrastructure uh, by coordinating samples and by using systems, uh, by bringing the biomedical ethicists and the uh, other educational materials that are available. Uh, and also, uh, we bring all together the experts, whether this the IM consultants, the genetic counselors, and the genomic odyssey board that uh, is uh, developed or consists of all these experts uh, in place. What we have learned over the last uh, now a year or so operating in this clinic, particularly in the case of diagnostic odysseys, uh, we found that um, in the end, what it takes to solve uh, these puzzles, uh, uh, it's going to be a collaborative and multidisciplinary team approach. Uh, we have challenges. Those are not easy cases. We know that at best, if we able to solve 25 30% of those cases will be successful. But again, uh, those cases bring their own challenges and it will take only the coordinated effort of many experts to come together, discuss, uh, and see whether they can provide some uh, answers to the, to the cases. We know also that it takes a lot of time to develop a new clinic as uh, if you have to do it for another clinic in any medical center and it takes a significant amount of investment and in infrastructure that has to be well thought, implemented, and changed as needed uh, as you uh, go through the, the initial phase of this process. We know also that to establish patient criteria, although I have my slides with ideal cases, is not always easy. Uh, we, we know very little about these decisions. We haven't done this for a long time to know uh, how the decision relates with the outcome. And also, there is a lot of interaction among us where we'll, we'll, when we meet about what is the best approach to pursuing these cases. Is it going to be a single testing better in some cases if they haven't done anything versus a panel testing versus exome sequencing? I think uh, this is the experience that we built. And over time, uh, we're going to move probably to more exome sequencing and to do this right away. But there are some cases that someone can make the argument that not every final test uh, has been exhausted in some of these cases, and it may be worth uh, to consider this approach. But at the same time, we realize that genomic counseling is, very, is essential for those, uh, for those patients. We know that many of these patients come to us uh, self-taught about uh, exome sequencing and what this may mean, but yet we realize uh, through um, our experience, and particularly through our protocols that we have uh, along with the IM clinic, that well-educated patients, they need uh, help sometimes and conversations 
to understand what are the issues and make decisions with the help of the certified counselors. We know also that patients need uh, education materials to come with them. Uh, this way they can uh, continue reading about these issues when they go home. And sometimes uh, we think it's important to have an electronic interaction uh, as far as education because uh, these are opportunities for them to learn more and come back to us with more questions. And this interaction is what creates the, you know, the, the outcome that can be useful uh, to them in addition to providing the diagnosis. There are issues about billing codes uh, and, and all these lab services. Some of those have been established and recognized by, uh, by payers, but there are many other items that we have still to understand and do better than that. And this is the nature of starting something new and uh, not knowing about this until you do it. And so uh, these tests are costly. We know and also that current reimbursement systems do not address uh, using genomic medicine in practice. We found, though, in some cases, uh, insurance companies were able to pay for the entire service because they thought it was of value. And so still, uh, it's a learning process for us and for the payers, and I think for all of the, for all of the uh, parties involved around this diagnostic audits and exome sequencing. And another important item, too, is about the scale of the process. It takes significant resources to have this counseling in place, to develop this genomic board to discuss the results. And so we may require new systems in place to be able to scale up these approaches in years to come. The turnaround time for, for this technology uh, is long, uh, about, I said, three to four months, uh, sometimes even longer. And this may limit uh, cases that may have an acute problem to be solved and they don't have the uh, time uh, uh, to have a, an answer. Uh, and also, it's important to do more uh, education about these processes to our patients, to our referring physicians, um, to third parties. Uh, also, education and, and more translation about uh, findings uh, to educate ourselves of how we can define, define better ways of moving this forward, of moving the bar, as I've shown you before, uh, from the more uh, Mendelian to the, to, the, to the more complex disease and how we can do this in an effective way to provide to our patients. The patients, and, and they have to understand uh, uh, what this technology means and what are the expectations. We have also uh, to change sometimes the, uh, the national policy about the reporting of these laboratory uh, uh, findings and the requirements related to that. And of course, we know the significance of bioinformatic analysis, the data, the huge volume and the complexity of those elements that as time goes by, uh, we expect uh, to improve, but they still remain uh, challenges. For the next steps uh, of our clinic, we like to address uh, the challenges and we we'll continue to refine this model uh, to make it more useful and more applicable to our cases. We have developed significant expertise in the last year or so and experience by performing all this uh, testing in our first uh, 50 cases or so. But still, we have to see how can we make this a more effective approach for more answers uh, to benefit our patients. We have to keep continuing educating ourselves as healthcare providers and have also to uh, expanding the service to a group of patients where we think there is an uh, element of learning, particularly in the cases where they overlap between Mendelian and complex diseases. And of course, this will bring pr probably to a new state where if, as we're pushing the bar more to the right, more understanding will be available to us and then we'll be able to help additional individuals who present with these diagnostic dilemmas. Thank you for your time. I'll be happy to answer any questions during the discussion. Thank you. Casas? Casas. We've got one quick question before you leave this stage. Uh, someone wanted to know if the family you described with PSC had uh, any manifestations of pulmonary disease or surfactant, perhaps related to a defect, in that uh, gene? No, not to my knowledge, based on the history that we have. Thank you, Casas. Um, we'll continue with the lineup. I am proud to introduce Kelly Ormond. Uh, she needs uh, really no introduction. Um, she's the director of uh, genetic counseling at uh, Stanford and uh, has been um, active in all fields of uh, genetic counseling for many years. I first worked with Kelly nine years ago on a project uh, on training physicians uh, in genetic medicine, and um, it's remarkable um, uh, that how far we've come. With that, uh, Kelly. Thanks, Doug. Okay. 
So you'll have to forgive me because I have a really bad cold, so I'm gonna try to make it through this talk without hacking up something. <laughs> anyway, I was asked to talk a little bit about the Diagnostic Odyssey from the perspective of pediatrics and also from the perspective of a genetic counselor, which means I'm gonna be a bit different from both of the talks that are bookending me and then I'm gonna try to focus a little bit on the patient and family experience. And I've retitled my talk, How Genome Testing is Changing the Diagnostic Odyssey a little bit. Let's see here. So if you're not familiar with the actual definition of Diagnostic Odyssey, it's really interesting. I have a student who's doing a research project on this, and I said, oh, go look up papers on the Diagnostic Odyssey, and she said, I can't find anything. It's this sort of visceral thing that we all talk about, and anyone who works in clinical practice knows what it is, but it's quite hard, actually, when you really look for papers to nail down a definition. And obviously, what it really means from a patient perspective is sort of this long, meandering trip to try to figure out what on earth is going on with an individual in the family. And for those of you who work with rare diseases, you know what this is like. These are the people who are wandering from doctor to doctor. They're desperately looking for the answer. And they undergo pretty much every test that they can find in order to figure out what's going on. And everybody's frustrated because really they feel like if I could just figure out what's going on, all of this can be resolved and it would be better. So there are often big expectations. And so what does that name mean to families? Um, it means a lot of different things. And it's certainly always worth talking to families when they're sort of struggling through this to get a sense of where are you with this and what are you hoping that diagnosis will actually bring you. And obviously one of the things from the medical perspective that we hope for is that it's going to give us a prognosis. We're going to know, you know, especially with kids, are we talking about a condition where things are going to change suddenly? Are there other things? organ systems we should be screening? Is this gonna be a child who all of a sudden develops developmental delay? Or is this gonna be something that's really sort of medically stable and you already know what you're dealing with? So parents get a, a sense of control when they know a little more what they're dealing with. And that's part of what they're looking for. Of course, they're hoping against all hope that there could be some sort of treatment that's gonna change the course or cure. Um, that's gonna be obviously in the minority of cases, but that would be great. And we've heard some examples of that even uh, just this morning in the plenary session. Um, family members really, really care about reproductive risks and recurrence risks here. It may be this particular family is thinking about having more kids and they want to have a better sense of the chance of having another child where they're going to be dealing with a similar condition. It may be that people have gotten older in the family and now we're talking about a sibling with this condition and that sister or brother is thinking about having kids and they're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and then there's just kind of this sense of closure and legitimacy. I wasn't crazy. This was actually happening. And that really makes a difference for families when they get the diagnosis. So these are a couple quotes. Um, you may be familiar with the Genetic Alliance. They have a branch over in the UK, and on their website, they actually have a really nice little PDF booklet about the Diagnostic Odyssey. So these were two quotes that I pulled out of it. If you have a diagnosis, you're on some sort of track. Without a diagnosis, it feels like you're lost in a swamp. And I don't know what's going to happen to him in the future, and that's the worst thing, I think, the not knowing. Um, I thought also Dr. Jacobs little video this morning really illustrated how parents feel around the Diagnostic Odyssey. I probably could have just shown his video again and I wouldn't have needed to give any talk this morning. Um, and this is usually what happens. You have a child, regardless of what age they are, they sort of show up in your clinic, they have a number of things going on and nobody's been able to figure out what's going on. So the families, you know, sometimes it's their first visit, sometimes it's their 10th visit, and they're just looking for somebody to put it together. And historically, I mean, it's been a long time since I did very much pediatric genetic counseling, but you would kind of work with the geneticist and you would try to put it all together into that puzzle. And you would try to come up with a clinical diagnosis in the most case. And people are always surprised to realize that less than 50% of the time we're coming up with diagnoses, and that number has not changed that dramatically in the past 20 years, which is a little disheartening. Hopefully genome testing will push us a little bit further in that direction. But usually people would kind of go through the testing process, and I'll skip this slide, but they would start off by doing chromosomes because that was the only thing available. Um, now we pretty much start with array CGH, and that does a much nicer job of picking up some of these micro deletions that might explain it. Um, if they can come up with the specific gene to do testing on, they would order that test. And this, of course, leads to lots of problems, as many of you already know. If you pick the wrong gene, you're not gonna find anything. Um, parents oftentimes have a really hard time understanding why we can't just get that right on the first try, or why it's so complex, or what a VUS means. Um, so 
recently, we've ended up in a situation where we might have genetic testing panels. And I know our next speaker is going to spend a lot of time sort of walking you through examples of how this is going to play out in clinic. But the testing panels are nice in the sense that they're going to group together a lot of genes that may have a similar clinical presentation. Um, they may or may not have the same depth and sensitivity that you're going to get from single gene tests. So that can be a downside. Um, but if you can't really distinguish things, they're certainly going to make it a little easier and sometimes more cost effective to work through this process. So it's a little faster for families. And now obviously we know we've got whole exomes and genomes and they're starting to be used to make diagnoses in families. You're all familiar with this. And ACMG last year came out with a policy that essentially recommends that whole genome and exome sequencing be offered for these diagnostic odyssey cases. That's really the bottom line. So if you have a patient who has features and you can't come up with a specific diagnosis or you have a suspected diagnosis and either there's some genetic heterogeneity or you've done testing and everything's coming back negative, these are the families where they're offering testing in a pediatric setting. And I think you all heard Eric Green this morning say if you have a child in your family or you're seeing a patient who falls into this situation, he thought it was sort of a no-brainer, if I may paraphrase, to start start with the genome in that family. Um, and you get back a report that's got both deleterious mutations and VUSs around those suspected phenotypes. Um, and then in some cases, you're going to get back other information as well. So how often are these exomes actually giving us answers for these families? Um, this is a slide that was created by some of our genetics fellows at Stanford, and the data is about six months old. My sense is the numbers haven't changed a whole lot, but basically we're coming up with about 25% answers. And the rest of the studies that I'm aware of, the information from the labs is showing probably between about 25 and 50% last time I checked. Um, the Baylor patients, it was about 25% when they did, looked at their first 250. And then this is the paper that Dr. Jacob talked about this morning. And when I did my back of the hand calculation, 9 out of 26 was 35%. So I think you can assume that probably around 25 or 30% of families are going to get an answer. And what that number is is going to vary depending on how much testing's already been done. Okay? If we've already looked at a lot of things, you may have a lower rate of diagnosis here. The other really interesting one is um, this paper that came out last year from the folks at Children's Mercy in St. Louis and St. Louis, Kansas City, I'm sorry. Um, and they were actually looking at this idea of rapid diagnosis in the NICU, with the idea being you've got these critically ill infants and the parents are really struggling with what to do medically. And that if we had a better sense of what the diagnosis was and therefore the prognosis, it would allow parents to at least make more informed decisions which is obviously what everybody wants. Um, they did have a number of diagnoses that they made, both retrospectively for sort of proof of principle and then also prospectively. I think there was only one case in their series where they actually had changed the medical management on the basis of that diagnosis. But it's an interesting thing to think about in terms of how else we're going to be influencing the diagnostic odyssey here. There is a huge emotional pressure to test. And these are a couple of quotes from an article that came out a few months ago in the Journal of Genetic Counseling. I'll just read this because I'm guessing it's small font. I think it would be great because I know for me, that child, no one really has the answer because nothing's tied in together. That if there could be a test that we could pin pinpoint it better, and again, her future health. If there was something to give me more of an answer or call it a name and tell me what's in her future, what are we going to be, I would jump on it in a heartbeat. So parents are really kind of desperate for these answers, and physicians know that. And they actually say here um, at the end of this particularly long quote, let's see if I can find it here, um, it's almost irrelevant what else you find because generally those patients are so sick it doesn't matter, and he kind of goes on and on about this. And many of the families we see are so desperate for information. So the idea here is that many parents are so desperate for an answer, they may not think about the informed consent process for genome sequencing and all the other information that may or may not come along with it. They just want the answer for the thing that's in front of them. So we have to be really careful in our informed consent process to make sure that we're raising it in a pretty overt manner. Um, parents reflect a lot that when their child doesn't have a diagnosis, they really need to advocate hard. And these were two more quotes from the Genetic Alliance website. Um, if you're able to go in and say, he's got so-and-so disease, they go, oh, okay, that's fine. But you can't. You have to go back from birth when you were first told and explain the whole thing. And I carry all the letters I've received from pediatric consultants and geneticists to every appointment. Sometimes those letters haven't been put on file yet. Sometimes I have to pull out the letter and show it to them. So this idea that because there's not a diagnosis, the parent is really in charge of making sure everybody knows what's going on and all of the symptoms, it puts a big burden on them. 
You may be familiar with Hugh Reinhoff. I think he's the biggest example in the public about families chasing down a diagnosis, and he was a person who had a molecular genetics background and essentially found his daughter's diagnosis, and that was recently published, I think, probably five or six months ago, um, and they found a mutation but she's the first person that it's been discovered in. And so he sort of reflects, if you read some of the articles about this case, on how what he would really love is to find somebody who's 80 who has this same mutation. And then he would have a better sense of prognosis. So it's this concept, um, Joanna Fanos wrote about it several years ago, this idea of the first families, where we're going to be coming up with people who are novel variants, and we're not going to know what to tell them. And that's really a big challenge here. So I'm gonna back up a minute. The medical benefits of genomic testing as far as solving this diagnostic odyssey are you don't have to have the same level of clinical skill. Um, we all know that there are probably only about 1,400 certified clinical geneticists and that they're not everywhere, so access is a huge issue. And if you really needed to make a diagnosis on a child where there wasn't a clinical geneticist, maybe some of these panels or the genome testing is gonna make it so you don't need that same level of clinical skill. It's gonna cause different problems on the flip side if we have people who don't know what they're doing ordering these tests. Um, it certainly can be faster and often cheaper. We can get more diagnoses than we could otherwise. And again, sometimes you can modify your clinical management. Um, this is a nice paper that came out of a large retrospective chart review of folks who had myotonic dystrophy type 1 and 2, identified through an NIH registry, and it actually looked at what happened after they got the diagnosis and how long it took. And it was seven years to diagnosis for the type 1 myotonic dystrophy and 14 years to diagnosis for the type 2. So that's a huge amount of time to spend kind of wandering around all these doctor's offices. And they did actually show through chart review that these delays in diagnosis um, ended up with delayed symptomatic treatment, a slower ability to enroll in any of the experimental treatments, and also higher unemployment and um, bigger problems getting disability. So lots of impact on life. One of the technical challenges is that we often don't know what to do with this data. We end up with things where association may not tell us that it's causal, and I think a lot of the CNVs have really shown that clearly. Um, and obviously we're gonna have a lot of false positive results here. We might find something in the child and then find it in the mother and the sister, and they may not be symptomatic, so we don't know if that's causal or not. And I'm going to give you two quick clinical examples from um, Stanford's medical genetics group where we thought we found the answer, and then you had to kind of keep wandering. So this kind of gets at the red herring issue. So in this first case, we had a five-year-old. He had microcephaly, dysmorphic features, developmental delay, pyloric stenosis, and autistic features. And they did an array and found a deletion at 2P16.3. Um, that overlapped with the norexin gene, which some of you may know has been associated with some of the autism spectrum disorder features. Um, they did a lit review. They sent it off for duplication deletion testing of this gene, and it turned out it was an intronic deletion. So then they thought, hmm, maybe that's not it. They went on and they did whole genome or whole exome sequencing, and they did find a de novo mutation in the DRK1, wait, DR, DYRK1A gene, um, and it was classified as deleterious according to the guidelines, and when they looked at the clinical features, that seemed to fit, so they feel now that that's the causal explanation. So if you had stopped with your first test um, and not done any of that follow-up, you might have missed the real cause. Another example here, they had a nine-year-old child who had Roban, hypotonia, and developmental delay. There had been lots of prior testing done, and there had been this one metabolic test done that they kind of flagged, but they weren't sure what to do with it. So they went on and they did an array. Um, they found a small deletion at 3P24. Um, it com contained part of the TGFR beta gene, and so they kind of looked at this again. They did some deletion duplication testing, and they didn't see anything. So they weren't sure what was going on with that first array, if it was an artifact or what. Um, so then they went back to that initial test that they had flagged, and in fact found two mutations that were consistent with that particular disorder. So it just really, my take home point is, you have to look very closely and not just assume that when you see a variant, it's automatically the cause. So now the family finally has the answer for what's going on, and I think one of the key things, and we did learn this from newborn screening, is once you raise the flag of what's going on with the child and that there might be something, even when you have the answer, parents sort of think this is gonna solve all their problems, and they still have that remaining uncertainty. Um, and 
even when you have a diagnosis, everyone who's a clinician knows there's going to be variability. So there's still going to be uncertainty about prognosis there. And I think the third thing is that as we gain prospective data, we learn about the expanding phenotypes for a lot of these disorders. I think the, the perfect example of this is if you think back to when we first learned about BRCA, we would have told you the penetrance for that condition was really, really high. And as we followed more and more families beyond those that were used in the identification studies, um, that penetrance inches down. So I think that we have to be cautious and we have to let families know that things may change as far as our prognostication as we learn more. So I'm going to end by talking about the transactional model of stress and coping and this idea of how we can support our families through this diagnostic odyssey. And if you don't have a genetic counselor on staff with you, hopefully you've got social workers or other folks who can provide families with this support. But I do think it's really important. And I pulled this table out of an article that was in the Journal of Genetic Counseling recently. And you can see that they talk a lot about some of the things that modify anxiety. So the time waiting for diagnosis, again, is a huge factor, the child's age and the parent's age, perceived help, helpfulness of the individuals they're interacting with. And then they talk a lot about uncertainty and personal control. And if you go back to the psychology literature, one of the things that comes up is this idea about problem-focused coping versus emotion-focused coping. So problem-focused coping is, I have a diagnosis and I know what that diagnosis is and here's what we can do about it. So if there's an action that someone can take, you can do that problem-focused coping. If there's information providing a sense of control, that's problem-focused coping. Um, so this is gonna be, I'm educating you about genetics, I'm educating you about the clinical and natural history, I'm educating you about the prognosis, I'm educating you about the tests we can do to monitor your child, and also providing links to support groups. So families are a great source of education, and just knowing other people who've gone through it before can really help families feel as though they've got their hand around it and give them a larger sense of control. The other aspect is emotion-focused coping, and this is great when there's nothing you can do to change it. So if something is completely out of your hands, um, really validation. This is a really tough process. I know what you're going through. It must be super frustrating, that kind of stuff. But also, and this was key in the paper that I cited, um, providing a sense of hope and encouragement when it's possible and realistic to do so. Parents often feel like we're so focused on the medical aspects. We're all doom and gloom, and all they want is to just have that little ray of hope in the background. And so whenever we can do that realistically, I think that's very helpful. So I'll just end by acknowledging one of my graduate students for giving me some of her resources, and I'll stop there. Thanks very much. We'll continue on with uh, Dr. Linder. Uh, Dr. Linder is uh, formerly of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and now the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, she's a medical geneticist who has made many contributions to the understanding of hereditary cancer syndromes. Uh, Lainey? Thank you. Good to see you all here. Um, as I've listened to all of these talks, there's a fair amount of overlapping uh, information, which I think is good because the messages are coming through as um, consistent. And um, I framed this talk on when we should jump from traditional diagnostic work up to sequencing, and just to put that conversation out there. Really, the objective is then to become familiar with the pros and cons of a traditional diagnostic workup versus introducing a next-gen sequencing option. So um, the traditional workup for suspected genetic conditions has followed a, a very uh, stereotypical pathway. It involved collecting a detailed medical history, family history, detailed physical exam. Chromosomes were almost always ordered, particularly for developmental disorders. Biochemical studies would be ordered, particularly for episodic or progressive disorders. And there were a variety of syndromes that experts would try to line up and see if the patient matched any of those pigeonhole diagnoses. If there were gene tests available, one might test by Sanger sequencing for one or several genes if a specific syndrome could be suggested by the clinical features. And Sanger sequencing um, is fairly expensive. It's still the gold standard for genetic sequencing. And um, 
it's probably more than $1,000 on average for each gene at this point in time. And I'm going to show you some actual numbers. You've probably seen these types of numbers now and, and know that there are vast numbers of genetic conditions um, with all types of inheritance. And of those for which a molecular diagnosis is known is about 4,000. And there's almost as many gene tests that you can order now. So this picking out one gene at a time has become something about problematic from a clinician point of view. I'm going to use this condition as my example because there was a fabulous paper written about it that tried to bring in the question of, of the genetic testing and on whom and when. So it's an early onset epileptic encephalopathy. And my made up case was a healthy young woman who gave birth to a healthy baby at term after an uncomplicated pregnancy and delivery. At three months, he began to have seizures and it was very difficult to control them. Um, many, many non-diagnostic studies were conducted, and I'll leave that to your imagination. By age three years, he had global developmental delay. The parents wanted to have another child, but were very concerned about the risks that this would happen again, as they really didn't understand what this child had. So there are a variety of clinical names that have been given to these children who develop these epileptic encephalopathies at early ages. And I'm flashing them up there. They're clinically, they overlap. Um, there are some distinctions the neurologist could appreciate. As a group, they're um, characterized by frequent, severe seizures, often leading to developmental delay and or a deterioration neurologically, and often a poor prognosis. The recommended workup for the epileptic encephalopathy, again, starts with your careful history, physical exam. And I'm not producing, I'm not introducing this to try to make you know about this disorder. It's really intended to illustrate. Uh, physical exam, family history, look at inheritance pattern, and a review of systems to consider specific testable syndromes. Um, that's the reference in July 2012, came in at all. And with the review of systems for the epileptic encephalopathies, um, there's a long list of pretty obscure types of things that the diagnostic specialist is supposed to know to ask about. And in the really fine print, I've told you what the diagnosis is that goes with it. But most physicians in practice, I'd say most neurologists and most geneticists without looking it up, probably wouldn't know to ask all of these questions. But should you be uh, wise enough to do that, it might lead you to a single disorder. But I think this illustrates <laughs> the complexity of the diagnostic evaluation. So the authors go on and say we should look at the equivalent of chromosomes. So rather than doing a karyotype nowadays, we use this comparative genomic hybridization to look for missing pieces or duplicated pieces of genetic material, or a SNP array does the same thing. Fairly limited biochemical workup for the disorders of highest uh, hits. And then brain imaging. And then if you get specific findings on the brain imaging, you might chase the genetics of that. So if you have a brain that doesn't fold correctly and it's smooth, there are at least 13 different genes that could cause that. If you have a brain that didn't cleave into its two halves, there's at least 25 genes that could cause that. And if at the end of this, there's no specific syndrome recognized and no brain abnormality to guide the workup, then some additional gene testing is indicated. So prioritizing the gene testing for any of the genetic disorders has typically been based on the understanding of the prevalence of that particular gene mutation in that particular clinical scenario. And I think it's more defined in this particular entity that I'm using as my illustration than it is for many of the disorders we see. It's very poorly defined for many of them. So this is actually my most interesting slide. So if you were taking a nap, this is the one to, to watch for here. So, um, and I'm sorry the writing's so small. I'll read it to you here. So, so they recommend testing for the SCNA1 gene. And about 70% of children who present with severe myoclonic epilepsy will have a mutation in this gene. That's a pretty high number. It's usually de novo, so that family history is not going to be much of a clue. 
And I called the laboratory that does the testing for this, and it's about $6,000 to do this test. I called twice, because I didn't believe that. The next gene um, accounts for about 5% of females that have severe myoclonic epilepsy in infancy, $1,600. The CDKL2, about 10 to 20 percent of females presenting the first six months of life, it's excellent dominant, it's usually de novo, it's about $5,000. ARX has a polyalanine tract expansion, about 5 percent of males with infantile spasms, and two different labs I priced out here. One was 600 that only did the expansion, the 3300 does full sequencing of that same gene. Another gene accounts for 10 to 30 percent of patients that would be classified as this um, Otohara syndrome, about $1,000, and Paul G, about $1,200, Fox G1. Now we're down to 1 percent in females, 2 percent in males, um, about $2,200. And the MECP2 gene, um, particularly in males, and you get some very low statistics on that, about $3,000. This would be Sanger type sequencing. This is not next gen. So, at what point does it actually make sense to continue this one gene at a time approach versus going on to the next, a newer approach? Should it be based on costs? If you added all those up, it's about $2,200 or $22,000. But of course, if you got a hit somewhere in there, then you would reduce that somewhat. Should it be based on probabilities of finding something? So you start with the most likely and go to the least. And this is really an area that needs so much more research. There's really no consensus on when to make the jump to a newer technology and a lack of empiric data to inform these decisions. I think these numbers start to tell a story in and of themselves. So. so in the traditional diagnostic workup, it does have some pros and cons. The pros is it could be more cost effective if there's a very limited number of genes to consider. It would reduce testing unnecessarily other genes and other tests. Um, it, there's a lower chance that you'll get a variant of uncertain significance if you're testing fewer genes. It does rely on that highly skilled diagnostician to recognize likely syndromes, and there's a, a hole in our fabric of our medical uh, distribution system now that way. And the traditional workup can be more expensive if a large number of tests are performed. So next-gen sequencing, which you've been hearing all about, is a different technology that can study many genes really for the price of one Sanger study. And I looked up um, a commercial lab, and um, so for autistic spectrum disorders, it looks at 61 genes, cardiomyopathy 51 genes, and here's epilepsy. Uh, they include the genes I had priced out for you before. It's 123 genes, so really the, the menu for epilepsy genes is quite a bit longer. Um, eye disorders, neuromuscular, short stature panels, X-linked mental um, intellectual disability panels. And the epilepsy next-gen panel it was $5,200. So, Compared to a traditional workup, the next-gen panels would be more comprehensive, so there is the potential for making a diagnosis quickly. It is more cost-effective if you're considering multiple genes. It doesn't rely on the extremely skilled diagnostician to recognize these rare syndromes. The pretest counseling can be complex, particularly with regard to the incidental findings you will have greater numbers of variants of uncertain clinical significance. And I'm going to talk more about this, because I think this is one of the more confusing and um, uh, challenging areas of next gen. You will have somewhat less coverage per gene than Sanger. So if one does a big epilepsy panel and you don't find something, there's going to be this niggling concern that maybe if I went back and got that SCN1A gene, maybe I missed that mutation in that gene. And you can imagine the insurance company conversation if you want to go back now and do the gene that was already on your big panel. And the next gen does not detect all types of genetic lesions. It does not detect um, large duplications, deletions, promoter mutations, trinucleotide expansions. It gets fooled by pseudogenes, and it doesn't have any epigenetic changes. 
onto the BUS. As far back as 2008, these were recognized as being problematic. Um, Susan Domchek, writing about the breast cancer genes, um, defined VUS as a sequence variance in a gene where the effect on the sequence change on the function of the protein is unknown. Um, and I don't know why my slides are off there, but it uh, says those undergoing genetic testing and being presented with a variant of uncertain significance um, is, I don't know what that word is here. It's clinically and emotionally difficult situation. Advising individuals with a VUS on surveillance and prophylactic surgery is challenging for providers, confusing to families, and distressing for everyone. So for genes for which there's limited experience, and that includes a lot of these rare disorders, including the things on the next gen, you're actually more likely to get a, a VUS report than a clear-cut result. And there are these programs, these in silico tools like Polyfin and SIFT, and there's a long list of them, that alone are not adequate or appropriate to really help you clinically. Most VUS are not going to be reclassified anytime soon. You're going to be living with this result. The American uh, College of Medical Genetics has proposed five classes of DNA results, and this parallels the uh, international five classes. And so class five would be your pathogenic, class one would be your <coughs> benign. And I think what's most useful about this slide is that the IART group actually gave some recommendations on how to use these clinically. So the VUSs are the class threes, and they recommended surveillance for relatives just based on family history, research testing for relatives, but no predicting test, predictive testing for relatives. It's really a non-useful result. You have your history, your physical, your family history, but it's, it's not useful. It's hypothesis, hypothesis generating. And if you're lucky enough to have zebrafish to put these genes into and so forth and can carry the research out and get an answer, more power to you. Most of these will not be reclassified anytime soon, though. So despite advances in the classification of the U.S., and there are many, many good scientists all over the place working on this, there are going to be vast numbers of VUSs in the BRCA genes where they have tested over a million people at the main lab in the United States. There are now thousands of VUS that can still not be classified because they may be a one-of in a family, and there are not functional assays that describe all the functions of the BRCA genes. So to reclassify requires more than looking at these evolutionary um, conservation programs. You need to be really careful of those. And the, um, again, the American College has a draft criteria for classifying the VUSs that is not quantitative like the IARC one. And um, in their five classes, the use of the in silico programs for classifying is considered a supporting type of evidence. It's not a standalone, it's not strong, it's supporting. And I think you can kind of see how this um, recommendation is written, but to be pathogenic, one could have a standalone type criteria, two strong or one strong and three supporting, okay? And so that in silico tool is in that supporting group here. And all the way through, it's not considered adequate for making the call. So we're glad they're out there, but the conservation-based calls are just not that accurate. They overcall, they undercall. So the disease-focused next-gen panel versus whole exome sequencing here. Um, let's think about the pros and cons of these now. So the disease panel, um, I think, might be something to consider if you think you know one or a couple of genes that are causing this phenotype, you might go to the traditional one gene at a time thing. But if you, and if you have a clearly defined, although polygenic phenotype, like the epileptic encephalopathy I presented, you might consider the disease-focused panel. But if you don't have a hunch about the diagnosis at all, and the phenotype doesn't fit cleanly into one of the disease pigeonholes, whole exome sequencing might be reasonable. And if you've already been down the other diagnostic pathways and found nothing, whole exome sequencing might be reasonable. And what sort of a patient's most likely to benefit from whole exome sequencing? And this is where we don't have excellent criteria to say, yes, bring this patient on, but no, that one shouldn't do it. Um, so if you sequence a patient and it turns out 
that that patient actually had a mutation in a known gene that's known to fit their clinical picture, then you've just hit a home run, okay? You can interpret that as a patient in isolation. But if your patient has a novel clinical picture, you could be looking at an unanticipated presentation for that known gene, or you could be looking at a mutation in a gene that was never before known to cause that disease. And you really can't diagnose this by just studying that single affected person. You need to have either multiple people in the same family, or you need multiple families with you know, affected individuals. <coughs> So I'm going to say that again, and maybe we can argue about this later. But. So if, if the underlying diagnosis is due to a mutation in a known gene, you can make the diagnosis in a single individual. And some of what you're seeing published and presented in terms of successes of whole exome sequencing are exactly that. It was a, a little bit confusing picture. You sequence and you actually find the gene mutation, and yes, it fits in retrospect, in hindsight. If the underlying diagnosis is due to a mutation in a new gene or unexpected presentation of a known gene, you really can't do this with a single individual, but you might be able to make the diagnosis if you have multiple individuals either from the same family or across different families. So based on general principles, features that make whole exome more likely to be successful in your diagnostic odyssey patients, DNA affected on more than, available on more than one affected and available on those who are clearly not affected, which is not always that clear. Um, phenotype clearly uh, definable. Phenotype not thought to be particularly multifactorial. Phenotype might suggest a candidate pathway. I think we heard a story this morning about a gene that was right next to a gene that was known to cause that particular phenotype. A Mendelian pattern is helpful. Consanguinity can be helpful and features that might reduce the chance of whole exome sequencing making a diagnosis, or is you just have that one person within a family or between families, that's all you have. Difficult to assign affected status amongst family members. Phenotype that's poorly defined or poorly understood, so particularly some of the immunologic cases that have come to us were on so many drugs that change the function of the immune system, you couldn't really phenotype what that person's immune system would look like if they weren't on all those drugs. Um, a phenotype that's not usually attributable to single gene processes, and no clear Mendelian pattern in the family, and no consanguinity. And with that, I will turn over the microphone to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have a few minutes for uh, discussion. Uh, please feel free to submit uh, questions through the application uh, for the conference, and they will come up here on the screen of the laptop here. Um, to continue on, uh, we do have some uh, prepared questions for polling of the audience, and um, I think now would time to be go uh, would be a good time to go ahead with our first audience polling question. Um, if we could proceed with that. While we're waiting for that, um, I wanted to, uh, oh, here we go. So um, I'll give a little bit of background for this question for those of you who are not actively involved in uh, whole exome sequencing on a clinical basis. Um, one of the um, concerns regarding whole exome sequencing is incidental results. Uh, for example, uh, let's say a patient with um, intellectual disability has whole exome sequencing um, and no gene change that would cause an intellectual disability is identified, but instead there's a gene change that's strongly associated with the development of colon cancer later in life. Uh, what would uh, one do with those results? Should one return them to the patient, especially if they're a child? Um, should one not return them? Um, uh, to, to, uh, along those lines, the American College of Medical Genetics um, issued a policy statement stating that um, for whole exome sequencing that is conducted, if incidental findings are identified in one of 57 known genes, usually uh, hereditary cancer syndrome genes, those results should be 
uh, passed on to the uh, patient um, and uh, without any ability to opt out of those results. And any of the panel, cor correct me if I'm misstating that. And so one of the big controversies in medical genetics uh, is whether people do, uh, whether this is correct. Should people have the ability to opt out of receiving these incidental findings? Um, and so we'd like to pull the audience to see what their, what their thoughts are. And I'm having difficulty reading, but I'll try to. Uh, it appears that the, the responses are evenly split uh, amongst uh, the guidelines are in the best interest of the patient, 48%, um, uh, versus the patient should choose uh, whether they're interested in these findings, slightly less at 42% uh, in the third category is uncertain. Um, so maybe I'll start with the uh, very end of the panel and come, and come back toward me. Uh, Wendy, what, what are your thoughts about um, this recommendation from ACMG that incidental findings for these hereditary, mostly these hereditary cancer syndromes need to be returned regardless of patients' wishes? Um. I think it was useful to try to draft a list of findings that were important enough that there could be some agreement among some group of experts that people might benefit from knowing them so that labs could prepare how to, how to run their pipeline to analyze those genes if, if that became the standard of care. However, I, I think that um, personal autonomy trumps this and that uh, it should be a conversation between the patient and the genetic counselor about the pros, cons, risk, benefits, and the patient um, should be given some opportunity to say yay or nay to that. And it could be presented as a group of experts think you need to know about these genes so that they know it's coming from a, uh, a thoughtful group, but I still think the patient should have the last say in it. Kelly, I'm really interested in um, your experience with this as you went off and doing these consents. And um, particularly, I've been struck about um, really well, whether in some of these situations you can conf can perform informed consent. Uh, people are really, in some of these highly charged situations, looking just for any cue what they should answer or not answer to. I think that's a great point. So I guess first I should disclose I was one of the co-authors on those ACMG recommendations. So that probably says something about what my ultimate views are. But I do think that, that you've hit the nail on the head there. It's really hard, especially when you have a family who's there for a specific clinical indication, to get them to actually step aside and say, oh yes, I want to actually think about whether or not I want to have those things because they're so desperate for the answer. So I think that is the first problem is to get true informed consent and it does become a bit of a farce in that sense. Um, I think people, it's very hard for them to understand that this might happen to them and there's this challenge in Everyone thinks, not, maybe not everyone, but the vast majority of people think that they would want to know this sort of information and data from biobanks and other things has suggested that people really are saying out loud, I expect you would be telling me all the bad stuff that I might need to worry about and do something. And we haven't been so far. So this gets at that point. Um, there will be a very small minority of people who have strong feelings and want to decline. And you know, as a member of that working committee, it, it was the sense that it would then be a conversation, not that this would happen without informed consent or that people wouldn't know it, um, but it would be a dialogue. And if someone really felt strongly that they didn't want it, there, there might be alternatives for how to address that, whether it be specific panel testing or other things. So I strongly believe that there should be a discussion and a dialogue about it. Um, well, I know, Costas, we've had many conversations about this. My personal feelings have go gone up and down depending on the time of day and the last patient I saw. And, <laughs> yeah, um, right. I'll just uh, check in with you since the last time we talked yeah. about what your thoughts are. So uh, I think I feel strongly about giving the autonomy to the patient to make a decision as long as we're presented with the options and uh, for them to understand what this means and they have the last word of going for it or not. That's how I feel about this. Thank you, Costas. Um, we can uh, maybe uh, go on to our next uh, audience polling question. Oh, thank you. And the question for the panel and the people sitting here on the stage is, who do you feel would be best equipped to discuss and explain whole exome sequencing to the patient? 
And, but I'm missing part of the question. Um, I think the answers are a gen counselor slash geneticist in, in Australia. You can see the other questions. Some combination of the above. It's the blue. Can we see the other op is there a way we could see the other options. Primary, Primary care, care and specialty, specialty physician. Thank you. Um, you read it to us. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, address this question. Um, I'll start. Um, and uh, I guess I would, my, my, my uh, opinion would be um, all of the above. Um, I know that patients often very much value the opinion of their primary care physicians because they have a relationship with them. Um, in reference to whole exome sequencing, I think the primary care physicians are, would be, in, in the most part, limited in the specific advice they could give, but patients would value w really whatever their primary care uh, physician would, would give them and uh, uh, then perhaps receive more pointed or technical information from uh, medical geneticists, genetic counselors, and, and similar professionals. And I'll open it up to the panel. I think we would need to um, help provide talking points for most primary care physicians to be sure to cover all the highlights. And um, I, I think that personal relationship really matters, but it also matters what the content is. And um, we just have a big education task ahead of us. Um, with that, I'll switch to some questions uh, submitted by the audience. Uh, first question, does the Mayo IM Clinic uh, plan to see a quicker turnaround on whole exome sequencing results soon. Um, I will sp speak from my personal experience. Um, I have received results on three whole exome sequencing testing, uh, tests for diagnostic odyssey. Now it's important to differentiate these from the uh, cancer testing or tumor testing. And the turnaround times were 121 days, 212 days, and 236 days in that order. So I've seen progressive <laughs> increasing in the turnaround time. And um, the labs tell me that they are overwhelmed with the number of samples to process. And uh, not only that, uh, interpret the data, and they simply cannot hire you know, individuals fast enough to build their bioinformatics structure. So I, I personally don't see the um, turnaround time you know, decreasing any time in the next uh, several years. Especially if you consider you really want to, in what I found, test three individuals. Oftentimes, these three individuals, one's with you in the office, the other two are relatives that are in disparate locations like Fairbanks and British Virgin Islands or something like that. Um, and with, with that, I'll open up to the panel. I would say if I could take the next uh, opportunity to answer. Um, numbers will improve. It will take some time. I'm, I'm more optimistic than you, Doug because I think that those are scalable processes that if someone invests the, the resources to do it, it may improve, but uh, it's not going to be in the next year or so, but it will happen, I would say, in the next two, three years, we'll see improvement. Uh, that's my prediction, but I may be wrong. Um, Kelly or Laney, anything to add to that? Um, I'll turn this slightly so you can see it. Um, Next question, I'm a practicing internist or a family medicine doctor. Uh, what is the takeaway would you want to leave me with this afternoon? Um, thank you. Uh, well, I would, my, my thought would be to leave you uh, with the appreciation that uh, there are new tests that are available for patients who have not had answers before, especially if those patients have a clear phenotype, meaning they have something distinctive like um, a malformation, abnormal lab value, um, especially if that, that is in their family. And uh, the resource for those individuals would be a genetic counselor or a medical geneticist. Um, and uh, I'll ask Costas anything to add those longs. As you said, about. a strong family history of a phenotype that you can detect in a family is uh, profound. And that's, that's our friend. Uh, and then uh, we can apply this technology to see whether we can have an answer. But uh, a strong family history cannot replace anything else at this point. Uh, Kelly? Can, can I just sure. add? I, I think that the, um, 
the number of people who can achieve diagnoses today is so much different than it was 20 years ago. And if you have a patient that has something perplexing and you don't know what it is, it might be that it could be diagnosed if, if the newer um, science was brought to bear on that patient now. So I think not to accept just, I don't know, for constellations of, of odd findings within an individual or a family. Just dig a little bit harder. Um, go to the next question. Maybe I'll direct that to Dr. Linder um, first. Um, and it relates to um, the interpretation of findings on testing. And I'll, I'll paraphrase the question. Are there a category of variants that do not need uh, additional data, historical, epidemiological, lab data to be considered deleterious? Uh, for example, coding, insertion, deletion, or splice site mutations. So is there a mutation, I, I'm, I'm thinking for the person who asked the question in my own mind, um, is there a mutation you get a report back, let's say it's never been reported before, but just on the basis of the mutation, you could say this is disease causing yes, in that patient? Uh, yes, there is. So you have to um, know uh, whether that gene, for example, is uh, inactivated and that's its mechanism of disease. And if so, then, for example, a mutation that introduces a stop codon almost anywhere in that gene would inactivate it and you would expect to be disease causing. So even if that particular stop codon had never been seen before in the history of the world, one could make a quite educated guess that, that this was going to be a deleterious mutation. So that's one of the types of mutations that American College of Medical Genetics recognizes as um, probably standalone. If it's in a gene that's, whose mechanism is known and, it's, and this is um, what the mutation would do. And I think this will be the, the last question here that we can take today before we're required to break. Um, are there concerns uh, regarding these type of tests at a uh, prenatal stage uh, since there may be no cure or treatment? Um, that's uh, the, the ability to cure or treat genetic disease has often been a key deciding factor about whether to offer it. Uh, for me, the example that comes to mind is Fragile X uh, pr uh, prenatal screening. Uh, there's a disease that causes intellectual disability uh, called Fragile X, which we could uh, screen the uh, population for and detect um, children at, at birth with it. However, there's no, there's no um, treatment available um, that could modify the disease. Um, and I think maybe this goes a little bit to what uh, Kelly was saying. There's often that um, uh, balance between, or, or that thought is, how much is knowing worth? You know, how, how, how much are we going to put that on knowing if there's nothing we could do um, for, the, for these diseases? And I think it is important to point out that there have been a couple of reports in probably the past six months or so of being able to do whole genome sequencing on fetal data actually non-invasively through mom's blood. So technologically, it's a reality to expect that one could do this. I think the real question is the social and ethical question of should we do this? And it sort of goes back to that perennial eugenics question. What should we be allowed to know and as a society who should decide that? And I think it's really critical that those sort of stakeholder groups of individuals who have these different conditions are really involved in any policy decisions around how this may sort of play out. I think we're already seeing a huge change with non-invasive prenatal testing such that we can look at aneuploidy in mothers as early as 10 weeks gestation through a blood test and they're not diagnostic yet, so they're not replacing MNEO and CVS, but they have for conditions like, like Down syndrome probably around 99% sensitivity and lower for some of the other aneuploidies. So it will be interesting to follow that and, and see where it goes. Uh, well, thank you, Kelly. And I'd also like to thank the rest of our panelists. And I'd like to thank the audience. I hope you have a nice time here in Rochester.